you know, I love Flying Vs. I love Explorers. I love Les Pauls. I love BC Rich. I love, you know, all these cool rag guitars. Um, Jackson's, of course. God, I used to play Pink Jackson. And I just love these guitars. But it's something like a Telecaster is just something like, um, it's just a part of me. And I think it's so important because uh, Sam Ash, the big, huge music chain, just closed down. And I think it's so in important for a kid to walk into a music store, pick up a guitar, and play it and go, mm, nah. And But when you pick up that right guitar, it's just like something you can't even explain. It is magic. It is magic. And that's what happened with me at a, with a Telecaster, you know? Hey, this is John Five, and this is On The Record with Ultimate Guitar. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and dealing th with us through some technological difficulties, as often happens. So we might as well start there. Uh, you're currently doing uh, a lot of solo stuff. You're in one of the biggest rock bands in history, and yet I've been told by your tech that your rig is remarkably simple. Why, why do you keep it so simple? Just like an old school way, like just a couple stomp boxes. I mean, when I say a couple, I mean a couple, very, very few stomp boxes. And, you know, you know um, amp, a head, a, a good amp, a good head, a good guitar, good pedals. That's it. You know, I just keep it so simple. I just want to be able to play a show with any kind of equipment and not be like uh, relying on something like, oh, I have to have this or I have to have that. I can actually go play a show anywhere, you know, with any kind of equipment. And I think it's all up to, you know, your hands, but I just choose to just use very simple things like a great amp, great pedals, great guitar, and uh, that's it. Do you mind telling us what a couple of those pedals are or your go-to amp? Is it a stock amp? Everything is stock. There's nothing that's modified. Um, I'm using uh, EVH heads. I was using Marshall, but it was very difficult for me to get Marshall amps, Marshall products, because um, we'd be traveling so much and there's multiple rigs and multiple things and things would break down and I couldn't, you know, they couldn't get me gear. I'm like, oh my God, like something's wrong and we're playing the NFL draft, you know, the next day or something. I need a head, you know, and they were like, oh, we don't have anything or, they, you know, it was really, it was tough because, um, you know, and then we were flying all over the world and I needed rigs here and I needed rigs there and it was very um, difficult. So I moved over to EVH and uh, they've been just wonderful and they sound incredible. And um, so I'm just using EVH, nothing's modified, everything's stock. And same thing with, I just use Boss pedals, a Super Overdrive, a... Uh, what else am I using? I'm using a chorus, a boss uh, super chorus. What else am I using? I'm using, God, it's so very few things. A delay for like the end of songs, nothing crazy, uh, analog, boss analog delay. But it's very, very elementary. And you know, my Coast uh, John Five guitar from Fender, which I love, That's that's something I would I carry it everywhere, everywhere. We'll be walking through the uh, airport and I'll have the, you know, the guitar and the other guys will be like, great disguise, dude, you know? And uh, so I carry it everywhere, everywhere. Cause I'm always picking, you know? Yeah, I've always known that about you. Uh, it's rare to see you without a guitar. And you're, and I love the ghost, by the way. That's amazing. That's something about the painted fretboard. I don't know. It just does something. 
I know it's really cool. It's very difficult to do for Fender, um, you know, to do that painted fretboard and then putting those frets in. Because when you put the frets in, it you know hits those it hits those it hits that paint. You know, it's tough. That's why you probably don't see a lot of painted fretboards. So when I think of heavy guitar tone, uh, you're one guy who comes to mind. And from what I've heard, you don't use a whole lot of gain. And some of us equate gain with a heavy guitar sound. Uh, to you, what makes a guitar tone heavy? You know, I think what makes it heavy is just a really good tone. Because if it's too distorted and too noisy, it sounds abrasive. And it sounds, even though it's, you know, it might not even be loud, but if it's loud and there's not that much gain, like an ACDC tone or something or um, anything like that, uh, I like it not to have too much distortion because then then your playing is way more percussive and everything comes out uh, clearer, if you will. <clears throat> it comes out very um, distinct and clear, loud and clear. And But if there's a lot of gain, there's just noise on top of that uh, on top of the volume and there's just this noise and there's, it's just very, to deal with that noise, you lose a lot of that, uh, percussiveness and because it's covered up with noise. So that's why I don't use a lot of, um, gain and also playing in these really, really big places. You want it to be distinct because there's such an echo around the whole arena or stadium and you want it to be as distinct as possible. And uh, it also works in a small club, like to have it so like not too much gain, very percussive. It could be loud, but not abrasive. I like that explanation of it. Um, and I would, I would imagine a lot of the techniques that you employ with the very fast picking, chicken picking, that would kind of be muddled up and eaten up with, with a high gain sort of situation. It absolutely is. Actually, I have to alter my solos, like, like the guitar solo spot, you know, where everyone goes and buys a t-shirt. I have to like alter it sometimes in different venues because of the echo and all that stuff, you know? So, um, you're always a busy man. It's it's very rare to catch you at home, um, so I'm I'm glad that you were able to take some time to chat with us while you're at home. But uh, what does the rest of 2024 have in store for you? Um, I am about to in about eight days. We go and do some shows with Motley. Um, I think we're going to Illinois. We're going. <laughs> it's funny. It's. Going with Motley, it's it's great because I don't really have to worry about anything. I just like am like turned into the area I'm supposed to go to, and then I just walk over there, and I like it's incredible because everything is taken care of. Everything you can imagine is taken care of, so I don't really have to even worry about anything about. Uh, where I'm going or how I'm getting there or anything. I just worry about being on time and playing the best show possible. And that's wonderful. So I'm going to go do that in about eight days um, with Motley. And then um, we're going to go do some more shows. We're going to come home, do some more shows. And we're playing at this place called Mohegan Sun. And right after that show, I jump in a bus and go right to my first gig the next day. So in Boston and starting the instrumental tour, and we're going everywhere, you know, starting in Boston, then we're going, um, hitting a bunch of places and going all through Canada. And, and it's just, I, I enjoy it so much doing the instrumental stuff. I just enjoy playing guitar. I just really enjoy having a guitar in my hand and playing. And, you know, if 
you can find something that really makes you happy, I think just do it, you know? And that's, that's, that's what I do. It just makes me really um, happy to be doing that and talking with people and hearing people's stories. I don't want to hear my stories. I'd rather, you know, talk to you and say, oh, what do you got going on? What, you know, and like, but real talk, like and stuff. I really like talking to the fans and stuff like that. I, I, I get a, I get a real pleasure out of that. And of course, you know, you're getting the best of both worlds with the solo stuff, uh, playing the big arenas uh, with a band. Uh, as far as writing in the studio, do you prefer doing solo albums or collaborative sort of writing experiences? Because I know you've done a lot of both. Um, and as far as the collaborative stuff, are there some artists that you'd really like to collaborate with at some point? I really like... Again, I know it sounds strange, but I love just to be in the studio and making music. And a lot of people don't like to collaborate, but I love to collaborate because there's so many things that I'm like, God, I would have never thought of that. That's so cool. And I think that's the magic of a collaboration. Um, and who would I want to work with? But I mean... This is, I got a, I got a phone call from um, Prince's Guitar Tech and, uh, you know, I love Prince so much. And I always said, oh, I want to, you know, play with Prince or jam with him or something like that. And it was just such a wonderful um, conversation because he goes, yeah, dude, Prince, you know, liked your playing and he, he knew that you weren't just a you know, metal guitar player. And, you know, he liked your telly playing because he played, you know, a lot of telly too. And he goes, yeah, I remember, you know, Prince said, you know, get a hold of John Five. I want to jam with him. And it just really, really um, made an impact on me, you know, and it was such a special thing. And that was just uh, yesterday, you know, I got that call. And it was so cool to get to hear that because I have, I have such a respect for Prince and his playing and his songwriting and his performing. It's just um, he is a pinnacle for me. So that was a very um, unexpected, really cool thing that happened. Um, and of course, the Dolly Parton thing me and Nikki played on uh, was just wonderful too. So uh, there's, every day is a gift, you know, and so many things happen and I'm just very thankful for it. I don't know if you remember, but I'm, I'm from Minnesota. So the Prince thing hits pretty close to home. There's a purple telly behind me that was uh, very much a Prince inspired uh, instrument. So, so I know you've expressed that you're, you're a fan of Buckethead's playing and he's been a fan of your playing as well. Uh, has there ever been a conversation about a, a collaboration there? No, you know, I love Bucket so much. And, you know, he's actually one of the reasons why I started playing out live. I was, you know, playing, making records. And then... I would, you know, I love Buckethead and I would go see him and go play... And I was like, maybe I should go do some live shows, you know, because I really enjoy going to see Buckethead so much. I enjoy it. And I, you know, maybe if I go play some shows, other people will enjoy coming to see me and hopefully inspire others to go play their own, you know, instrumental shows. So, yeah, I, I um, love Buckethead very much. And, um, but we never had a chance to do any shows together, but I would love to, you know, he's a very private person and that's another thing I really love about him. It's, you know, he doesn't obviously do interviews or anything like that. And I think it's, I really love the, you know, how he's not letting it all out there or he's not telling us how he feels or how he's this or how he does this or how he does that. I just, 
love that it's so private and it's not demystifying or anything like that. I really love that about him too, because nowadays with social media, which I'm guilty of, about, you know, it's like, oh, well, here's what I had for dinner or for breakfast, or here's what I'm doing right now, or, you know, but with some artists like Buckethead, you don't, you don't get that, you know, and I, I, I just really love that, you know, I really, really love that. It's always nice to have a little bit of mystery, but I, I do love your Knights and Satan service Instagram thing. I'm going to pitch that right now. If you're not a subscriber to that channel, definitely check that out. Um, as you're seeing, he's wearing a Kiss shirt. Uh, he is the biggest collector of Kiss memorabilia that I have ever met, uh, for sure. Yeah, it's it's that the Knights and Satan service. It's it's really something special because it's not like me saying, "Oh, look at me, look at me." It's saying this is a part of rock and roll history that has influenced so many artists like famous not famous that have influenced so many people but what a lot of people don't know everybody knows okay there was a lot of merchandise and there was a lot of things like that but that is just scratching the surface the surface there is it was star wars and kiss and we all know how big star wars was but it was Star Wars and Kiss, and we all know, okay, there was a lot of merchandise, but there was a lot of merchandise all over the world. Japan, South America, you know, Mexico, Canada, all through Europe. Like, it's unbelievable the amount of merchandise, and I only collect up until 1983, but it is a part of rock and roll history to keep that alive, you know? And I think it's important because, you know, it could all just, oh, well, what do I need this for? I'll throw it away. What do I need this, you know, promo poster from the UK for? I'll just throw it away. But this is, you know, part of um, history, history, if you will. And I think it's important. And I'm gonna do this, um, museum next year where a very 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 limited amount of people can come the reason why it's so limited people because i'm going to be there talking about everything explaining everything you can come there you can feel the outfits you can feel the costumes you can feel you know uh you can play the pinball machines the german pinball machine you can thumb through the records thumb through the magazines so but I'm going to be there explaining everything. So it'll be really int intimate because I just want to talk to everybody and, and go through everything with everybody and explain and explain the history. And it is like shoveling sand, you know, there's things that pop up. You're like, I had no idea, you know? So it's, it's really fun. It's interesting. And it's, um, uh, fun Instagram. It's it's a good thing for social media, you know. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get back to you know you did a lot of session work. Did it ever occur to you to just continue doing session work? You were doing some really high profile stuff. I would imagine if you wanted to, you could have continued to make a living as a guitar player doing session work. Um, did that occur to you? And why did you want to start you know playing in bands and doing your own stuff? I really enjoyed session work, um, and I still do it. Like, you know, I was just mentioned before, I just did that Dolly Parton thing, and which was uh, one of the uh, big honors that I've had in my life. Um, and so I'll do things like that uh, now and again, here and there. I did Tommy's record, uh, Tommy Lee's record, and which is an incredible record. Um, so I will do still uh, a lot of session work and I just do, I just try to do things as, as much as I can that makes me enjoy things because, um, you know, life is short, but I enjoy life so much where, uh, 
look at I get a chance to talk to you. We're talking about music and guitars and Kiss and you know it's it's wonderful. So whenever I get a chance to do sessions, I'll do it and shows and meet and greets and interviews and all that stuff. I really uh, am lucky and I enjoy you know everything that's happening. I don't know how many people watching this uh, know that you worked with David Lee Roth uh, in the late 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, something like that. Um, what was that experience like and what was it like working with him? Well, you know, of course, he's David Lee Roth and one of our heroes. And it was, it was really exciting. It was nerve wracking because you wanted to do a great job for him. But we had a... We had a great, you know, we could write together really well. Everything went really well together. And I really enjoyed being in the studio because it was just that thing. We, we clicked with each other with ideas and things like that. And it all came together really fast. So um, I've had nothing but uh, a great experience with uh, writing with Dave and working with Dave. We did this song, um, Nothing Could Have Stopped Us Back Then. Uh, it, it's about Van Halen, and um, and it is such a wonderful song. So you can see that on YouTube. And that's like one of the songs I'm most proud of because it's such a, uh, a tribute to Van Halen, but with you know, with David Lee Roth. And it's, it's just such a weird thing that, you know, if I knew that as a kid, that me and Dave would be writing a song that is a tribute to Van Halen. Um, it's just, it's even strange to say. So it's a, a song I'm very proud of. And yeah, and he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. So you're obviously very well known for playing a telly. Um, and playing really heavy music with a telly, which some people don't equate that with. I obviously have, but um, have you ever considered picking up a, a more metal guitar, a, a Flying V, a Gibson, Les Paul, something like that, uh, and, and using that as your weapon of choice? Absolutely. It's, you know, I love Flying Vs. I love Explorers. I love Les Pauls. I love BC Rich. I love, you know, all these cool rag guitars. Um, Jackson's, of course. God, I used to play Pink Jackson. And I just love these guitars. But it's something like a Telecaster is just something like, um, it's just a part of me. And I think it's so important because uh, Sam Ash, the big, huge music chain, just closed down. And I think it's so in important for a kid to walk into a music store, pick up a guitar, and play it and go, mm, nah. And But when you pick up that right guitar, it's just like something you can't even explain it is magic it is magic and that's what happened with me at a with a telecaster you know and i think that these music stores that are closing i think it's um devastating because kids aren't able to walk into a guitar store and you know really hold the guitar because you can't do that online you can go Oh, that guitar looks cool. Let me order it. And then you get, and you're like, eh, if, you know, it just doesn't feel right. Or it doesn't feel right to me. It's so hard to explain, but, you know, just imagine if, you know, our heroes didn't play the guitars they played, you know, who knows what would have happened, you know, or, or if Pete Townsend or Eddie Van Halen or Angus Young, you know, they all walked into guitar stores when they were young and played it and go, oh, this is what I feel, you know? So I think it's really important to do that. So that's, the Telecaster is very important to me. And But I love all guitars. I have a zillion guitars, but it's just uh, like an extension of myself. 
And you have quite a collection of vintage guitars as well. I, I know you frequent shops when you're out on the road. So when you walk into a guitar shop and you pick up a guitar, what sort of things are you looking for, specifically with like vintage instruments that might have been around the block a time or two? I like when things are original. I think I really love a story behind a guitar too, because I'm such a, I love history and thinking, oh, well this, here's the receipt of this guitar that was bought or this this guy was a, you know, a cowboy player because of the cowboy chords, like the, you know, at the top of the neck and stuff like that. Where this guy was, oh, you could tell, you know, he was an experienced guitar player because there's marks all over the neck and stuff like that. And I love the history of instruments because uh, if these guitars could talk, could you imagine the stories like... Oh, I, in 1962, I went to Paris and blah, blah, blah. It's, I just really love the history of guitars. And some guitars are like, I just sat under a bed for 50 years, you know, and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I really think it's important to keep these vintage instruments alive and, uh, and, you know, keep them in, you know, nice condition, but also they need to be played and loved, you know, and that's, that's what I like doing. Among your zillion guitars, is there one uh, that has a story that's special to you that you'd like to share? Well, you know, I have had like my gold Telecaster that I played all the time. It was just magic, magic, magic. It just was that thing. And I was like, oh my God. And I played it so much i played it so much that, and it has a metal pick guard and it wore through the pick guard like it had this huge dip because i would play it so much and they had to replace that two times because i'd play it so much and i had to retire it it was just getting played so much so i retired it now i have this ghost guitar not the one with the bar which i play all the time too but this other ghost guitar that was, I love, it's just, I have a connection to it. And it has the dots in the neck and stuff. And there's certain guitars you just have this connection with. And it's like a family member, you know? And, or it's just like an animal. And it's like this pet you love. And sometimes the pet needs to just take it easy and stay at home for a while. And, uh, but I wear these guitars out, you know, and hopefully, you know, after I wear this ghost out a lot, you know, you can get refrets or, you know, things like that, but it's never really the same. So I'm just going to enjoy what I'm playing now as much as I can. Now you're known for playing a lot of different styles, branching far out from the rock metal world. Um, we all love our shreddy guitar players like, like you, like Malmsteen, all the the shred guys, Eddie Van Halen. Um, what are some artists outside the rock genre that people in the rock genre should really listen to as far as being incredibly shreddy guitar players? With the, you know, the guitar players that shred, I've always loved someone that is great at something like BMX bike or baseball or anything that someone is really over the top. And that's why I have always loved guitar players like that, like Ingve or Paul Gilbert or anything like that. I'm like, I just love that. Like things being taken to the pinnacle and over the top. But there are other guitar players out there that a lot of people don't know about. Like there's this guy named Joe Mafis that you won't believe it. You know, he's just this country guitar player from the 50s, 60s. And this guy was just burning, burning. Or there's Brent Mason, there's Tony Rice, there's all these guitar players that a lot of the people in the rock genre don't really know about that. You would go, oh my God, you know, it's just so exciting. Um, so I really like to dive deep and explore all these different genres and, and really, uh, you know, 
listen to as many guitar players as I can. And you have quite a body of recorded work. Uh, is there a riff or a song or a solo that you're most proud of creating or contributing to a record? It's a tough question, I know. I know, it's a good one. Um, I love this song. Like, I guess a lot of the songs that I'm so proud of, I play live, like The Black Rass Plague or 666 Pickers. Um, I love Strung Out. I love... Um, cactus flower that's all done behind the nut. I, I just, I'm proud of those songs and I'm working on others right now. And I used to put out records all the time, all the time, but now I'm putting them out like a single at a time and then put them into a collection album. But I'm taking so much time and just really perfecting it. Like the ghost song I just put out or a Hollywood story. So what I do is I will play these songs over and over and over and over at home. And then when I go into the studio, I just play them live, you know? So if I mess up, I won't um, punch in. I'll just start from the beginning, start from the beginning. Cause I want it to be like a performance, just like back in the thirties and forties when musicians would play, uh, those were all live recordings. There was no punching or punch out. They would just, okay, let's start again. And that's, I think there's uh, such a, you know, I just think that's so cool because every song you hear back then were just all live recordings. So I know we're running low on time, but uh, I, I did have one other question. I usually ask, you know, for some advice to kids that are just starting out, but um, you've been in the business a long time and you've kind of carved your own path and uh, tons of respect for that. Uh, what's the best business advice that you ever got? You know, you learn as you go, you know, just you have to be smart. You can't just be like this great player because if you have a terrible business sense, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. You know, you can't come in too high. What I did is I always came in low. I always came in really low and then built myself up and I would have to prove myself, prove my worth, prove my worth meaning like I'm on time, I will do the best job for you, um, I'm loyal, and things like that, things that will, um, you know, other musicians, if you're going to go work for other people, I think that those things are really important, you know, um, and then you just move up, move up. So you can't come in too high because if you come in too high, they're like, no, but if you come in low, you just build, you know, and enjoy the ride. And, and I think that's what's important and be respectful to others. It's just, you know, you're living with these people and you're, it's, it's, it's all a business, you know, so always remember that. So, uh, what's next for you? Is there, is there another single coming out? Can we tease that? Yeah, I'm going to do a single, um, where it's really cool. It's, um, I'm playing the guitar, like this crazy, crazy kind of groove thing, but I'm playing the bass. Everything that's on the guitar is being played on bass too, but it's really a lot of fun. So I'm going to re release that soon. And then um, we have this documentary that's coming out um, and they've been working on it, a uh, documentary on me for a long time. So that'll be really cool. Uh, a lot of people are in it and it's a good positive message too. Um, you know, but the, Dolly Parton's in it and Peter Chris and, uh, Nikki and Tommy from Motley, uh, zombies in it, uh, uh Gary from Leonard Skinner's in it. Um, you know, bunch of people, bunch of Michael Anthony, of course, Rob Halford, Katie Lang, all these people are in this documentary. So it's really cool. And there's a good message behind it. So that should be coming out soon, too. Very cool. Very excited for all this stuff coming out, as we always are. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the music you put into the world. And uh, thank you for being one of the greatest people in rock and roll. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.